Um, so I'm um, only going to talk a bit about, well, certain aspects of um, image analysis specifically for uh, multiplex imaging data, which is still um, relatively new, I would say. Um, so directly up front, um, what I'm going to present here um, is joint work with Jonas Bintager. He's also on this call. So um, if there are Python questions, he might jump in. Um, yeah, he's a PhD student in our lab and a yeah, excellent software engineer. So he really makes um, the life of a lot of biologists easier. So I would start with a quick introduction to multiplex imaging. Um, the concepts that we're using, um, they're coming from classic uh, visual imaging. Um, you are maybe familiar with immu immunofluorescent imaging and immunohistochemistry where you have either fluorescently labeled primary or secondary antibodies or antibodies labeled with um, an enzyme that creates a visual readout. The problem here is that due to spectral overlap, um, you can only measure up to four fluorophores at once. And there have been several groups working on kind of uh, tackling this issue um, by different technologies. So there are two large um, directions you can go. Um, one is kind of cyclic multiplexing, and another one is uh, where you do use different text to these antibodies. Here, cyclic multiplexing, um, you either have oligonucleotide tagged antibodies um, to which uh, flu fl uh, fluorescently labeled probes bind sequentially, um, or for I incisive, they use fluorescently labeled antibodies, but then they have this strip and stain protocol um, to multiplex up to, I think, 25 to 40 markers at once. The nice thing about this technology is that you can image a whole slide, um, but it does take some time uh, for this cyclic strip and stain approach. The second approach is multiplexing via metal tagged antibodies. Um, so I'm a postdoc in the Bodenmiller lab. Um, the lab developed imaging mass cytometry, which is one of the two techniques. The other one is multiplexed ion beam imaging. They are comparable in a way that they use metal tagged antibodies and then either laser ablation or ion beam ablation um, and a type of light detector uh, to detect heavy metal um, ions. This technology is limited by the field of view that it measures. It's relatively small, um, but we can measure hundreds to thousands of samples um, in a couple of weeks. So the um, one thing that all these technologies have in common is kind of the, the data type. Um, so these technologies produce multi-channel images where every, these are grayscaled images um, and every channel um, stores the abundance of a certain protein, or even by now we are detecting RNA in tissues. Um, one of the first image processing steps um, also includes segmentation. Um, so we want to find um, objects in these images. Most commonly, these objects are individual cells. And then by combining multi-channel images and segmentation mass, we export single cell data. So this is, for example, the mean intensity per marker and per cell, but also morphological features or interaction graphs. And so what I want to talk to you um, about today is a framework that Jonas and I developed over the last uh, year or so, um, that really goes from the raw data uh, down to spatial data analysis. Um, the first part will be um, mainly based on Python um, for image processing and visualization. The second part will be an R also for image uh, visualization and spatial data analysis. So um, Jonas has developed um, Steinbock, which is a dockerized framework for um, multiplex image processing. And the main um, input here are multi-channel images. Depending on the technology that you're using, these can be um, in a proprietary file format. So we are working with .mcd files. Um, these can be also just TIFF files, um, which usually any reader function and then writer function can produce from your file type. 
Um, Napari is quite powerful in visualizing these multi-channel images, but also single channel images. Um, and Jonas has developed a plugin that specifically works um, with our data. And I will show you this in a bit. Steinbock is a framework um, that performs image pre-processing. This is file type conversion, um, cell segmentation, quantification, and then data export. So this is written in Python, available as a Docker container, um, and produces yeah, single cell data. Um, I'm more focused on developing bioconductor packages um, to handle imaging, but also single cell and spatial data. Um, I've developed Cytomapper that reads in um, multi-channel images and segmentation masks um, for visualization. And I've developed IMCR tools to read in uh, single cell and interaction data um, to perform spatial visualization and spatial data analysis. We do also export, um, or Steinbock uh, exports, uh, data in the end data format. So this can be directly read into uh, ScanPy or SquidPy. So um, I mentioned before, um, Napari is now quite commonly used um, to visualize multi-channel images. Um, one of the issues we have with our data, it comes in a proprietary data format, um, but Jonas um, built read IMC, um, which um, supports Napari IMC, a plugin to directly visualizing multiple aspects of our data. Um, and I can show you this here. So this is a slide overview. Um, and then we have these bright field panoramas of um, parts of the tissue. And then in these uh, yeah, overview images, we select regions of interest that we want to ablate and measure. And here you can select an individual channel. This is by Menten in green um, and visualize this on two selected regions of interest. Um, Jonas is selecting now a different channel. I think this is yeah, SMA and overlays it on um, the measured regions of interest. Um, of course, multiple channels. So yeah, I have to say we measure 40 proteins at once um, and multiple channels can be visualized here at once. It is quite reactive um, and all the settings are shared across uh, regions of interest. And then of course, um, users usually measure multiple um, regions of interest and multiple panoramas. Um, all of these can be interactively visualized. So um, a couple more details on Steinbock. Um, so, as I mentioned before, imaging mass cytometry doesn't come in the standard TIFF format. Um, one of the first steps is um, to pre-process it into a um, TIFF format. Steinbock also works with a so-called panel file in which you can specify um, the channel names um, of the, in our case, metals or um, fluorophores that you use, use for measuring. You can also specify there if you want to use these channels for um, image segmentation. Um, once you've generated TIFF files, there are two ways of segmenting these images. Um, with segmentation here, um, I specifically mean single cell seg segmentation, but of course there, there are also um, other segmentation um, or other objects you can detect in images. One route is um, using deep cell. This is a pre-trained uh, neural network um, that basically works out of the box within the Steinbock container. Um, another more classic route that we used in the past is to um, uh, label pixels in images um, based on if they are part of a nucleus, a cytoplasm or the background. We use Elastic to train a random forest um, to then perform pixel classification. And based on the pixel probabilities, we use Cell Profiler to then segment individual cells and images. Um, no matter which approach you use, um, you get segmentation masks out at the end. These are single channel images where sets of pixels with the same ID represent individual objects. 
Um, Steinbock then takes these masks and the multi-channel images and measures um, intensities. So this can be the mean pixel intensity per cell and per channel. It also measures uh, shape features of the cells and um, if cells are in close um, physical proximity and stores um, these um, measurements as CSV files. Data export here means that um, the measured um, the measurements can also be exported in, for example, the N data format. It is available as Python package. Um, for new users, we usually recommend uh, using it via the common line interface um, by using Docker in the background. And here I've just listed a couple of uh, commands. Um, these are all commands you need to really um, come from raw data down to single cell features. So you set an alias, um, which basically uh, specifies the docker run command. Um, Preprocessing is only needed if you don't have TIFF files available. If you have TIFF files um, available, you can directly segment these images um, using deep cell. And then there are three measurement calls that measures the intensities, the shape features, and um, cells in close physical um, proximity. It then produces um, a number of output files. It is quite standardized. That's why I was able to write a reader function, um, which yeah, puts all of this data together in a spatial experiment object. This then brings me to the R or bioconductor side of things. Um, so after image preprocessing, you have multi-channel images and TIFF format, segmentation mask and TIFF format, and then a number of single cell um, measurements like intensities, uh, shape features, and interaction graphs. Um, I developed SiteMapper to handle multiple multi-channel images and segmentation masks in R. Um, this is used for image visualization and cell visualization on composite images. And I've developed IMCR tools um, to read in Steinbock um, exported data into a spatial experiment or single cell experiment for then spatial visualization and spatial data analysis. We also have a more extensive um, R-based workflow available online. Um, that summarizes and gives guidelines to all these analysis steps. Um, I will first talk about Cytomapper for image visualization directly in R. So it allows the user to visualize cell-specific metadata on segmentation masks. So you can see here these small objects. These are individual cells that we segmented, and they are now colored by cell type, for example. You can also visualize um, mean cell intensity or um, well, other features, um, other expression features that you want to measure on segmentation masks. You can also use it to directly um, visualize pixel information. So here you can see um, a pseudo color composite image of uh, three of the measured markers. You can outline cells on images, um, I will mention Later again, this, this is quite nice um, to check segmentation quality control. Um, and we also provide a shiny app that allows you to gate cells and then visualize gated cells on images. I will talk a bit about the architecture of Cytomapper. Um, so it uses two data classes. One is the single cell experiment. It does also work with the spatial experiment, but it wasn't available back at the time. Um, the other object is called the Cyto image list um, data class. I had to write this to um, efficiently handle multiple multi-channel images where um, channel information is shared across all images. And it mainly exports two functions. The first is plot cells, which visualizes segmentation masks. Um, here, the mask object is a Cyto image list object that stores multiple segmentation masks. And uh, object here is a single cell experiment that stores all available expression or well, um, expression information or metadata 
related to the cells also found in the segmentation mask. To link these two objects, um, the user will need to specify um, a slot called image ID, which can be found in the element data of the cyto image list object. It's just a simple list uh, from the S4 vectors package. And the same entry can also be found in the call data entry of the single cell experiment. This is how cells are matched to images. Cell ID needs to be specified so that um, um, basically a cell ID, um, which is usually an integer, um, is linked from the call data of the single cell experiment to a set of pixels with the same ID in the segmentation mask. And here, for example, images are colored by cell types. The second function is plot pixels, which is a lot easier. Um, here, the main object is a site image list um, object, which stores multiple multi-channel images. And then by specifying up to six markers, you can generate these pseudo color composite um, images um, of marker expression. Um, during the revision process of the paper, um, one very critical point came up, um, the question about scalability, because images can be quite big. And um, keeping all these images in memory is just not feasible. And here's an example. Um, on the right, you can see um, a parallel visualization of 100 of our images. And they are even quite small. So every image is 500 by 500 pixels. The segmentation mask, which are just single, um, single channel images, are 200 megabyte in memory. Multi-channel images, in this case, these are 38 channels, um, are nearly 8 gigabyte in memory. So as an extension to Cytomapper, I switched uh, from using the image object from EB image to an HD5 array object from the HD5 array package. Um, which basically links um, images that are stored in the HD5 file format on disk. Um, Cytomapper provides the load images function. Um, the default works in a way that it reads in TIFF files, for example, and then if you want to store these images on disk, you can write them out as um, HD5 files. By now, it can also read in data sets directly from HDFR files, so you will never need to read in this imaging data into memory. So even hundreds of images can be linked um, within seconds and you're ready to visualize them in R. So now a couple of use cases of Cytomapper. Um, so one um, which people in the lab also quite regularly using is um, for segmentation quality control. So after image segmentation, you want to make sure that you actually detect individual cells and images. Segmentation is kind of a unsolved challenge in a way. There's never a perfect segmentation. Um, so the most straightforward way of checking is to just visualizing the outlines of cells on composite images. And you can do this by using the plot pixels function, which produces, in this case, uh, um, a three color composite image. If you also provide a segmentation um, mask object, it will just outline individual cells, um, yeah, um, based on the segmentation mask information. A nice thing about working here with the single cell experiment object is that um, it's subsettable. So you can specifically visualize cell types on images. Here's an example. This is a single cell experiment object that contains all cells of my experiment. But I only want to visualize beta, alpha, delta cells. These are, um, this is pancreas and uh, two sets of T cells. So I subset the single cell experiment object um, and I call the plot cells function to visualize um, cell types on the images and it only visualizes the selected cells. All other remaining cells are colored in white, which is specified by this missing color parameter. In a different setting, um, and this is usually used if you want to 
um, figure out if you actually phenotype the right cells. Um, you can subset the single cell experiment to only contain one type of cell and then outline, um, outline cells based on their segmentation mask. So here on the right, you can see um, I'm only outlining cells that we detected to be D T cells. And this looks quite nice. Um, well, this is actually data from Nicolas Damon from our lab. Um, and there was only one cell missed here. This is really kind of the powerful um, feature of multiplex imaging data that you can look at the data and see if you characterize the cells correctly. The last function of the cytomapper package I want to show you is um, a shiny application that we wrote to gate cells based on the expression and then visualize the cells on images. This all came from one of the big problems we have that clustering does not always work to really find clean cell phenotypes. So for single cell RNA seq or site of data, it's usually a bit more straightforward to find the, the major cell types. Um, due to lateral spillover and missegmentation um, in our images, um, certain cells always get kind of um, marker intensity from neighboring cells. So we use a classify or a prob probabilistic classification approach um, instead of clustering. But for class classification, we need some sort of ground truth data, which can be generated using this this Chinese application. Um, so you can directly load it from R. Um, yeah, it opens a Shiny app. You can select a number of um, gates that you want to set and the images that you want to gate on. If you want to gate on the raw count data or some sort of log transform data. And then here I'm gating on Ekaterin and CD3 to find T cells. And then again on CD8 to find uh, cytotoxic T cells. In the second tab, you can then visualize the images. Um, select the markers, adjust the contrast, um, zoom into these images to see if you selected the right cells and then save it again as single cell experiment object while storing um, the gated cell label. And for the design choice to do this per image, um, we usually observe small staining differences between images. So if you would start gating across all images, you introduce biases in that way. And in that way, you generate a, um, some sort of ground truth data set for classification. Yeah, then coming to the second bioconductor package um, that I wrote to kind of support the, the analysis of um, highly multiplex imaging data, but also in this case, any sort of um, spatial data. Um, this is called IMCR tools. The reach Steinbock function directly reads in um, the standardized output from Steinbock, and it produces a spatial experiment object or single single cell experiment object. Um, so Steinbock does already um, generate um, spatial object graphs. So these are basically edge lists. Um, where every edge indicates um, yeah, cells, two cells in close physical proximity. Um, but if you want to create um, these interaction graphs on the fly, um, IMCR tools provides the build spatial graph function, which takes a spatial or single cell experiment object and then um, builds a spatial KNN graph or via expansion or via Delaunay triangulation. And this graph is stored in the call pair entry um, to the object. For visualization, uh, IMCR tools provides this plot spatial function, uh, which visualizes the centroids of the cells. Um, and you can set any sort of features um, of the cells. You can also draw these edges between cells. This is quite useful if you want to observe um, kind of the range of the spatial interaction graph that you constructed. You can also color the edges based on metadata of the from node. Um, the first 
spatial data analysis function that I want to present here um, was actually, or the, the idea was developed by um, Gary Nolan's lab. Um, it is relatively simple. You start with this interaction graph, and then for each cell, you aggregate the direct neighborhood. So you can either compute the proportion of cell phenotypes in the direct neighborhood, or you can summarize the expression counts in the neighborhood. And in IMCR tools, this is done by calling the aggregate neighbors function. And then in the aggregate neighbors slot um, of the call data, uh, you can find this nested data frame where every column in this case uh, indicates the proportion of a certain cell type in the direct neighborhood. And in this second step, you can then use these features uh, to cluster individual cells. Usually we use k-means. Um, we need to like look into detail again if there are also graph-based clustering approaches that we can use um, to cluster cells. But what you usually uh, get out here on the right side are cells um, that are similar based on their direct neighborhood. So again, I'm presenting pancreas data here. And then all these orange and red cells are part of the pancreatic islets. The blue cells are clustered immune cells, and the green cells are clustered um, exocrine tissue. Here, this blue, um, this blue patch is quite interesting because it contains most of the T and the B cells. Yeah, so the, this cellular neighborhood uh, detection function is relatively unbiased. Um, IMCR tools also provides the patch detection function, which was developed by a former master student in the lab. Um, it's yeah, supervised in a way um, where the user needs to provide um, some sort of cell phenotype. Um, and the function will detect connected sets of cells with this exact phenotype. After patch detection, um, the function will then construct a concave or convex hull around the patch. And this can be expanded to directly also incorporate neighboring cells. Um, here, this is one um, example of the patch detection function where I specify all cells of pancreatic islets. And the result looks like this. So on the left, on the left side of this plot, you can see uh, pancreatic islet patches. So all of these cells are part of the, of the islet plus um, I think 10 micrometer, yeah, 10 micrometers surrounding the islet. On the right side, I detected um, immune cells that are close in, in close proximity. So let's say fully connected sets of immune cells. And then finally, um, the last function that I want to uh, present here is um, the test interactions function. Um, this was developed by Dennis Shapiro in the HistoCAD paper. Um, the idea here is to detect cell types that interact uh, more or less frequently compared to what you would expect by chance. And this is done again by constructing an interaction graph or using the one exported by Steinbock. And you first count the average number of cell type cell type interactions per image. And to get an estimate if these, um, these average interaction counts are significant compared to a random distribution of cell types, the function will create an empirical null distribution by randomly sampling the, uh, randomly per perturbing the cell labels of the image and therefore deriving empirical p values. This is something very similar to also what uh, ScriptPy is doing, I noticed. The output here um, can be visualized in form of heat maps, um, where the uh, rows and the columns just indicate the cell types. Um, the fill entry here is the average interaction count between these cells, and the little stars um, indicate significant significance compared to a certain threshold. Green means the cell types interact more often compared to what you would expect by chance. And the red stars indicate um, cell types that interact less frequently. We never really 
look at individual p-values per image, but we usually aggregate them across multiple images um, to figure out if certain cell types interact more frequently in a certain condition compared to a different to another condition or tissue type, for example. Yeah, um, so I'm already getting close to the end here. Um, this is just an overview on the next steps that I had in mind for Cytomepha and IMCR tools. Um, so I'm still not quite happy with the way of visualizing images in Cytomepha. It's still relatively slow when you need to draw all pixels in the graphics device. So I'm thinking about some sort of browser-based interactive visualization where maybe low resolution PNGs are written out to disk in the, back, um, in the background. Um, it would also be nice to kind of merge um, visualization of segmentation masks with spatial object graphs, still in one of the issues, but I didn't get around to, to work on this yet. For IMCR tools, um, it would be nice to implement some concepts of um, spatial point processes. So the K and the L function are quite regularly used when um, looking at co-occurrences of cell types or some sort of clustered cells. Um, there the question is also a bit if we need new data classes um, to efficiently handle um, these sort of multi-scale functions um, and their visualization. Um, also a bit related to this are kind of the, the open challenges that I'm seeing, and specifically um, image analysis in R. Um, so Cytomapper can read in TIFF, PNG, and JPEG um, directly into memory. I know that Raster um, is pretty good at um, using an on-disk version, um, or basically supports on-disk handling of TIFF files. Um, but from what I've seen, this is only single channel so far. That's why I used HD5 as file format um, to directly use the HD5 array package um, as an on-disk representation of multi-channel images. But again, these files need to be written first. Um, so I'm discussing with Jonas that um, Steinbruch should also support writing of um, HDF5 files, which might come in the next uh, release. And then, of course, there are um, more uh, efficient file formats for imaging data, like SAR and N5. And, um, I think some guys from Emble also presented this on here, NGFF file format uh, for which um, yeah, data handling is not really available in R at the moment. As for image visualization, um, I like the SVG Lite and SVG Pan Zoom package uh, for interactive visualization. However, that's a bit tricky to really control the resolution of the images. This is really the strength that, that Napari has, that as soon as you zoom in, um, you keep a certain resolution of the images by using these multi-scale uh, image formats and dask image. Yeah, with this, um, I want to thank the whole Bodenmiller lab. Um, of course, Jonas, who developed uh, Steinbock and Napari IMC, um, and of course, a lot of other tools in the lab um, learned for the supervision. Uh, Vito was a PhD student in the lab who um, worked a lot on the basis of um, all the data analysis approaches. Uh, Nicolas um, developed the first version of Cytomapper, which was really cool. Um, Jana, Tobias, and Daniel um, provided code support for IMCR tools. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Niels, for a fantastic overview and a fantastic talk. Really a lot of um, very nice functionality and infrastructure for um, spatial omics analysis. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite everyone from the audience. Uh, if you have questions um, for Niels, just feel free to raise a hand as people are already starting to do and uh, unmute yourself or um, ask in the chat. I see Artem uh, has a question, if you just want to speak up. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Niels, very nice talk. I, I had a question about the technology. So some of the early images you showed uh, had the darker um, 
borders around the individual tiles. So in immunofluorescence, this is usually due to uneven elimination. And I was just wondering what the kind of the physical process is for IMC data that gives you that. Uh, so that's part one. And then se second part of the question is, can you still use the same, you know, quote unquote elimination correction methods to correct for those dark, dark borders? Mm -hmm. It's uh, where you were showing uh, an Apari IMC. There's a kind of a darker pattern. In this video? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm. Um, so I know I know what you mean. Um, we usually don't really have these effects, um, as we don't. So we don't measure the whole region at once, but we do this pixel ablation. So a laser shoots um, basically into the tissue at a one micrometer resolution, um, and the material will then be yeah ionized and um, yeah led into this uh, time of flight detector. Um, so we actually never really have to deal with illumination correction. But you're right that for fluorescently, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I mean, I am seeing these dark borders, right, dark patterns. So what, what is causing that? Here in this image, you mean? Yep, yeah, like uh, on the gray channel, right? Do you, you see the dark uh -huh. grid? So yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, now I get it. So the the gray channel that you're seeing is a um, is a bright field overview of the image. Ah, okay, okay. And this is measured in. So this is. I'm not sure if you can see. Do you see my mouse? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is just one, uh, one image. So it will be stitched together. Yeah, the yeah. End. So, so yeah, if it's bright field, yeah. then you. you yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But we never we never really work with these overview images. It's just for us to get an orientation where we are in the tissue. All right, we have another question from Jacqueline. Yes, Niels, thank you so much. I, I, um, as an immunologist who spent countless hours counting cells by hand, I can't thank you enough for developing <laughs> kind of technology. I wish it was available 12 years ago. Um, so I, I have a couple questions. Um, so as you mentioned, typically we like to take, you know, multiple images. So uh, like 20 X or something. So just logistically, are you saying that we would take, you know, maybe like a five X image and give the submit that, is that the input or is the input 20 TIFF file, the 20 TIFF files that we took? And then I have another question after that. Yeah. Um, so here, with with chatter, I really mean a different um, different marker in a way, right? So for for IF, this would be a three or four image, uh, four channel image. Um, I, uh, or can you? Is this not what you meant? Yeah. So so you know, we typically like to count. If I'm counting cells, I'll take twenty mm -hmm. images and count cells from twenty different places along the, okay. the slide. So yeah. that I get a good representation. So the output then is is I have these twenty TIFF images that I would then have to go and hand count the cells. Yeah. So am I? So would I instead then submit those twenty images to you, or would it be submitting like an overview of the tissue, like at a at a lower magnification? Okay, Let's then I got it. No, yeah. so you would be submitting the individual images, but they will all be. Um, contained in this, this image folder here. I see. Um, so for Steinbock, for example, I mean, this would work if you have uh, 20 times an image where you have a DAPI signal and some sort of membrane signal, for example, or multiple membrane signals. Um, and then you can have as many images as you like in this image folder, um, and you can just call a single command and Steinbock will go through every individual image and then perform some sort of the, the segmentation, yeah. Gotcha. And so that's great. So my second question is around, um, so it, it these images that you've shown are beautiful, beautifully stained, but um, knowing that in the lab that doesn't always happen and, and often we have students doing it and there's, whether it's bright fields, you know, background, they let it develop too much in the background tissue, there's background on the tissue or if it's, there's some autofluorescence um, from immunofluorescence. And so how are you 
like quantifying the intensity? Is it relative to the uh, the background tissue intensity, or is it a threshold of what you would expect based on the type of stain that you're doing? Yeah. So um, in the the images that we're producing, um, we don't have specifically this problem, but I'm also working with multiplex IF um, data where you have all these, um, you have some background stain, um, how you really, so Steinbock works quite well, um, kind of ignoring all these, these issues. Um, this segmentation still works quite nicely. The question at the end is just, um, if you look at these mean intensity values, can you interpret them across images, for example? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know that other groups, they um, try to find some sort of threshold per image to then first identify positive and negative cells and gotcha. then only work with the phenotypes. And this is also what we are doing. If we observe very, very large sample effects, that's or batch effects, um, mm -hmm. we try to first correct them in a way, but directly perform clustering or classification on some sort of low dimensional uh, representation of the data and not really on the counts or the intensities anymore. Gotcha. Um, this is how we, so by, by correcting across all images first. So similar to how when we're analyzing flow cytometry data and we set the gate so you can say what's positive at the outset before you start analyzing the whole image. This is what um, yeah. Yeah, collaborators with multiplex uh, gotcha. images are doing, right? which is also really difficult because you need to look at every channel and every image individually. Yeah. So there are, we worked a bit on algorithms that identify the, per the perfect threshold, mm -hmm. but at the end, we always had a user to correct it in a way. Thank you. Sure. All right, thanks, Jacqueline. And we have a, another question from Frida Rica. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, I guess following a little bit up on what Jacqueline said, um, I was wondering, and you mentioned it, uh, what types of QC do you typically do for the cell segmentation? So is, is it always just manual, hands-on gut feeling? Oh yeah, this looks about right. Or are there some parameters and quality values that are being calculated that one can look at? Yeah, so in this workflow um, that I'm currently writing, there's a whole section on um, kind of quality control. Um, and of course, segmentation quality control is um, one of the big things. Um, it is really difficult though, because you don't know what the, the correct segmentation is. Um, so after looking at the images, we also start visualizing the expression um, of cells as some sort of heat map um, and then identifying features that overlap which are not supposed to overlap. Basically just really also looking at scatter plots. Um, if you only have 40 features then you have an idea on how they should be expressed. In our case we often see that um, CD3 and CD20 so T cell and B cell markers overlap which are not supposed to be. Um, but this is just because B cells and T cells are quite physically interacting in these structural input structures. Um, and then we usually try to adapt the segmentation approaches to resolve this issue as best as possible. Got it. And then just a side note. So, so what specifically is the difference between Cytomapper and IMCR tools? When would I use one over the other? So Cytomapper, if you want to work with images, and IMCR tools, if you only want to work with single cell data. Got it. So IMCR tools is basically just working with the matrix, um, yeah. kind of discarding the image part. Got it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. The next question comes from Robert. Yeah, great, great talk, Nils. Um, I was wondering your thoughts on like, how do we, what are, what are good experiments to think about sort of collecting so that we have a reasonable resource for, you know, sort of applying machine learning type approaches mm -hmm. to resolving some of the, you know, issues that you're 
challenge with right QC cell type identification, etc. Have you have you or or the the um, uh, Bowden Miller Lab thought about how how to do that and you know, maybe comment on what data sets you guys have made public or are planning yeah. to make public? Um, I'm, I don't think I have it on one of these slides. So about a year ago or so, we started uh, working on the IMC data sets package. Um, it's an experiment hub package um, or bioconductor package that now contains four or five IMC data sets. Um, but of course, it's only one technology. It would be nice to have um, codec, SISIF, 4i, any sort of multiplexed um, imaging technologies in there. Um, so I, there, are, there are attempts, for example, the um, original paper um, that presented Deep Cell or the MESMA model, they collected a lot of different data sets. Um, I'm not sure how they make them available. But the issue is just a bit um, kind of data storage and also really accessing this data. Um, I, yeah. I think question I'm yeah so I totally agree that big data is going to be a challenge for us and we have to find solutions for not shifting image data all over the place but I think it's it's more how do we get well annotated data sets right it's not it's not hard to find an image it's hard to find an image where there's some notion of ground truth and most machine learning approaches require you know, some, you know sort of in some sense the more data for which you know the truth, the, the better off you are in terms of trying to improve how, you know, sort of how the, the process actually works. Mm -hmm. For sure. So in our specific um, case, we provide these images in form of cyto image lists, and then we provide um, a corresponding single cell experiment object. And then via this image ID entry, you can link any sort of metadata, um, for example, the clinical metadata of the patients from which the images were acquired, but also the proportion of cell types um, directly to the images. But this, of course, is only kind of image level annotation. It would also be nice to have some sort of pixel level annotation, which we've done in the past to, you know, um, indicate if certain pixels come from the cytoplasm or the nucleus or if there are some sort of larger structures available um, this is what we don't provide at the moment Thank you. all right thanks um i also wanted to like direct a little bit of attention to a question in the chat which i think has already been answered by Jonas, but i found it interesting as i'm also dealing with these C stacks in the context of Murphish data. So Alex asked, can Steinbock handle data sets with multiple C levels? And although that seems not to be possible right now, I found it um, quite nice to hear that this is something that might be um, possible in the future. Um, on the other hand, Niels, maybe a question for me uh, from my side. Um, so we saw a lot of duality of single cell experiment and spatial experiment on your slides. So a, a bit more of a general question, are there, do you see there any bar barriers on, on, on your end to like broader adoption for like spatial experiment? My understanding is that a lot of the functionality that you developed or started to develop at this point, spatial experiment was just not a, around yet, but it figures that um, adoption would be possible, for example, moving the cyto image list over to the image data slot of a spatial experiment. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that, whether um, you, you, are, you are having interactions with these spatial experiment developers as you are having here a number of really nice use cases that these folks would certainly, I think, like benefit from in, in, in their developments. For sure. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so when I started writing IMCR tools, that was the point when um, spatial experiment just came out and I discussed with Dario a bit um, clearly via GitHub issues um, how to kind of synchronize image handling. Um, I, back then, and I'm not quite up to date, I think um, um, the spatial experiment only really supports raster images where um, which I don't think supports kind of multi-channel 
um, visualization so that you basically adjust um, the levels of an individual channel. So you can visualize, let's say, H&Es or some sort of bright field images, um, but then visualizing multiple markers as composites is not really possible with this um, data structure. And then maybe a last question from my side, if there are no other questions from the audience, I think that is a question that you most likely um, hear a lot. So if I understand you correctly, a lot of the functionality that is available in Cytomapper and IMCR tools is for analysis of spatial proteomics or spatial um, um, profiling of a handful of marker proteins. Um, I, I wonder your thoughts on uh, uh, to which extent do these concepts also apply, of course, to the analysis of spatial transcriptomics. And um, I think like, especially like in IMCR tools, these nice concepts, these uh, statistical concepts, these methodological concepts that you introduced, such as these neighborhood permutation testing and patch aggregation, they seem to kind of naturally apply um, also to a spatial transcriptomics analysis. Yes, for sure. Yeah, so you're right. Um, in terms of images, um, I don't see there are um, any application of site method to spatial transcriptomics data because the yeah, also the way you would quantify the images in Murphish or Seepfish. Um, the spatial data analysis functions that I've presented, they are directly applicable um, to spatial transcriptomics data because we are only working with cell types or let's say spot types. Um, I mean, yeah, perturbation would also be applicable for, for Visium, but I think um, in, C in fish type um, spatial transcriptomics data, um, it would actually be quite nice to apply these. You just need some sort of cell types at the end. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, then I would really like to thank you, Niels, again for a fantastic presentation, a very interesting discussion. Thanks for coming over, uh, at least virtually via Zoom. And um, I just wanted to say that the spatial seminar series will continue next week with Fabian Theis on SquidPy and in two weeks from now with Artem Sokolov on MC Micro. And with that, I am wishing everybody a great day and hope to see you next week. Take care. Thank you so much and see you next week then. Thank you, Niels. Thank Bye. you. Bye.